Well, so in, in the vertical ascent, um, which this is, that's one of the things this image comes from, it talks about um, the vertical holds primacy, um, whereas the horizontal operates laboriously, one might say, by way of a temporal progression through space. The fact is that vertical causality derives from wholeness, whereas the horizontal derives from parts. I wonder if you might talk a little bit about the difference between wholeness and parts and how that works out across all of um, not only physics, but across that whole picture of your iconic tripartite cosmos. Well, first of all, I think it, we, we need to realize that physics and modern science in general, by its very modus operandi, its intrinsic methodology, deals uh, incurably with, um, with parts. In other words, it can conceive of a whole only as a sum of parts. And so the causality which, uh, with which physics operates is a causality emanating from the parts and you can't say acting upon wholes because physics really has no, con no ontological conception of wholeness. The only wholeness physicists deal with is a, uh, is a sum of parts. So physics is based upon atomization. And it turns out, however, that uh, wholeness does play an absolutely essential role in the economy of life, whether the physicists know about it or not. And along with the idea of wholes, there is a corresponding causality, which I call vertical causality as opposed to horizontal causality. And I first introduced this idea of vertical causality in the context of physics. The new physics came in in 1926, quantum theory, and uh, very soon physicists realized that there's something very puzzling about quantum theory because a quantum system in its own right is a very, very uh, strange, bizarre uh, uh, thing. I mean, for example, if you have a quantum particle it will not be located in general in any particular point in space. In fact, there's a probability that it is in, given any two regions in space, there's a certain probability that the particle is in that region. So these quantum particles are very, very uh, strange entities. You, you can't really conceive of them except in mathematical terms. But what puzzled physicists is that when they make a measurement, in an instant, as it were, this particle, uh, instead of being spread out over vast regions of space, obtains a particular position. The measured particle is in a given place and time. And so this is something that puzzled the physicists. How is it possible for an act of measurement to collapse this probability wave and give a definite position to particles which have no definite positions before the act of measurement. And believe it or not, physicists have been kicking this so-called measurement problem around for a good hundred years, almost, <laughs> more like 90. For about 90 years, they've been speculating on this with no actual solution in sight. The weirdest ideas are presented by them uh, in order to resolve this conundrum, but uh, I believe it's still open an open question in the physics world. So this is what got me into thinking about quantum mechanics. And I came to a very simple conclusion. The, the reason measurement is not comprehensible to the physicist is that the measuring instrument itself is not really a physical thing. It is not the kind of thing that the physicist studies or, or describes in his equations. It is what I call a corporeal entity. So there is a difference between a corporeal entity and a physical ob an object. And the difference basically is that the corporeal entity is perceptible. If you think of the visual perception, it has color, it has qualities, uh, and we perceive it. So I realized 
that what had happened is that the physicist had abstracted from the perceivable world. The perceivable world is real, it's not an imagination. The red apple is there and it's red and we perceive it. But to the physicist, the red apple has become a res cogitans, a thing of the mind. So what happened is that in the 17th century, Western civilization became, as it were, controlled by one philosopher, René Descartes. Uh, he introduced a very actually weird philosophy and uh, it gained traction. It became the philosophy which scientists, and especially of course physicists, absorb as it were without knowing that it is a philosophy. They think it's just the way it is. And uh, so I realized that the reason that this measurement problem continues to mystify physicists to the present day, and you should see some of the theories they evolve in order to explain it, it's, uh, it, it becomes really weird. And the reason that the physicist can't resolve that problem is that uh, he has fallen victim to this Cartesian philosophy, and in the Cartesian philosophy, uh, there are no corporeal entities because all qualities are relegated to the mind. <clears throat> so they cut, as it were, he cut the world into two parts, res extense, extended entities on one side, and all they are is their quantities, they are, they are so to speak, the world as a physicist conceives of it. That's on the outside. And everything else, everything that's not the res extensa was, as it were, postulated to be a res cogitans, so a thing of the mind, a thing of thought. So René Descartes cut the world into these two pieces, and this has become, so to speak, the underlying philosophy which everybody who goes into physics absorbs unknowingly. And it is really unknowingly because I find that when I try to explain what Alfred Noah White had then called bifurcation, this cutting of reality into two pieces, the mechanical, the quantitative, and the rest is all supposed to be mental, uh, to the physicist, this is not a theory, this is the way things are. And when you try to explain it to him, he doesn't really understand it because uh, he doesn't know any other way of, of, of uh, conceiving the world. So what I'm saying is that in Western civilization, the intellectual class has uh, typically been victimized by this Cartesian philosophy. They accept this, not as a philosophy, but as simply the way things are. And uh, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a very tragic thing because, first of all, it makes life tragic. Just think, uh, when a father or mother uh, holds a child, according to Descartes, they're holding a res extensa. All that there is outside in space and time is a mechanism. It's a terribly tragic way of looking at life. And of course, I fully believe that it is false, but I'm, the point that I'm, that I'm making is that the world of science has been duped by this bifurcationist Cartesian philosophy. So they think of the world as greatly reduced. And uh, what I uh, marveled when I began thinking about the so-called measurement problem is this, that as soon as you step out of this Cartesian way of looking at the world, the solution of the measuring problem is very, very simple, childishly simple, because the measuring instrument is corporeal. That means it is perceptible. It owns qualities. You can see it. You can touch it. Uh, you can hear it um, give sound. Incidentally, if it weren't perceptible, it couldn't measure anything because measurement is a matter of seeing, say, a number on a screen. So uh, what has happened is that our men of science and especially men of physics uh, have been duped by a philosophy which uh, is totally imaginary, it is totally off course. And incidentally, the interesting thing is that in essence, this Cartesian philosophy was enunciated long, long by a pre-Socratic known as, 
Democritus. Democritus, yes. <clears throat> so Democritus, before Plato, the pre-Socratic said that all the people vulgarly think there's the sweet and the bitter, in other words, there's a perceptible, but in reality only atoms and the void. So this is a philosophy which the Platonist and Aristotelian schools completely disproved, disqualified. They were Rejected. smart enough to recognize <clears throat> that this is just a fantasy. But it is this very same philosophy of uh, Democritus. Democritus, thank you. Same philosophy that emerged again in the 17th century uh, through René Descartes. And well, it could, we, could, we, could we take a look at this, uh, what you were saying about the measurement, the, uh, the measuring equipment being perceptible? Um, I think what you're saying is that it is not a quantum mechanical measuring system. Therefore, you're working in two realms. You have the, you have the quantum realm, but then the measuring system is in another realm. Yeah. It's a level up, right? And, and then not only that, but the measuring equipment has been designed, and that's a level up. And then it's being utilized by that level, which is a level up from that. So, so just by virtue of the, the, the whole system of measuring, you can see that there is a hierarchy. It's not flat, right? Is that, is that part of what you're saying? You, you've got the point perfectly, and you've expressed it perfectly. Exactly. Um, the cosmos is hierarchic. It breaks up into different levels. And the corporeal level is actually the lowest level in the integral cosmos. It is what is represented by the boundary of that circle. That's where the cosmos comes to an end. And uh, however, the physicist uh, abstracts from that. He does not recognize the corporeal world for what it is, namely it's a sensible world, the world we perceive through our five senses. But he abstracts the quantitative part of that. So this is uh, the effect of Cartesian, of the Cartesian philosophy. The physicist is blinded by the Cartesian philosophy. He does not recognize the corporeal for what it is. And uh, so he has lost the whole idea of hierarchy. And he tries to build the world out of these quantitative entities that he has defined by his physics itself defines these entities and so they are not what the world is made of it's, you know wolfgang's um domain is physics but it's very graphic in biology right it's the same principle of life yeah. as a vertical cause on the living organism Right. And the analogy of the physicist and their abstraction process, right, versus a biologist who's going to literally like, you know, kill something and try to analyze its parts and figure out how to put the parts back together and make it alive again. And it's not possible. Right. And in science today, you hear all kinds of conversation about emergence. Right. And emergent properties. Right. Yeah. Like artificial intelligence. And I worked in artificial intelligence for years. This was part of what my Ph.D. was in. And I studied at the Santa Fe Institute. I studied complexity science. I was involved in the field of so-called artificial life. How do we create the right, you know, um, algorithms and conditions in a computer with metabolic tax and growth and reproduction and look for emergent properties, right? And then this whole thesis today in the world about artificial intelligence and technology that where this is an emergent intelligence is all, you know, coming out of this philosophy that says, let's get rid of the most important things, you know, go down to this level of abstraction and then try to recreate all the most important things. And that is what we fundamentally reject. And that's this idea of wholeness and parts, which is what you originally asked about and mm -hmm. vertical causation, right? It's actually consciousness and life and corporeality that affects the lower realms. And it's not the other way around. You cannot reduce you cannot abstract and reduce your way back to creation and to life. And that is the fundamental error of science, scientists, scientism, scientism, scientism. 